Okay, so let, let's start so we can finish before lunch. Uh, so, right, so, okay, before I forget the ever important sheet. Uh, so, we're talking about evolution. What? Oh, you can't hear? No, you should be able to hear. I don't know. And you can't hear me otherwise? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, I don't know if there's somebody here regulating this, whether, hello, this person, please fix it, but it's on. It should be working. What the? Is it okay? Okay, let, let, let's. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're talking about evolution and we're going to try and understand what the different forces of evolution that we defined last time do. And we're going to start with mutation and selection. Uh, and we're going to start with this first trying to understand the simplest case. Okay, so we're going to look at deterministic dynamics of mutation and selection. Okay, just to get it down. Okay, so we're going, that means we're in the limit of large uh, large n. We're going to look at large uh, numbers. The thing is, there's feedback on this thing. That's mainly why you probably can't hear. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know you can hear, but you can also hear, I mean, I can hear, a, 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 you know, a, an echo. And what Andra did yesterday is he reduced the volume. Is this volume? Let's see if this is better. Okay, la, 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 la. There's, there's still a bit of it, but we, we can figure it out. Um, okay, so it's going to mean we're in the limit of large population sizes. Specifically, what it really means is also that the, okay, I'm, I'm going to start using a word allele. Uh, I think I'm not going to help myself from using it, so I should explain to you what it means. So if you have, you know, this is really the way we think about it, right? We have many, many genomes. This is, you know, gen genome from organism one, two, three, four, and so on. And the way it works essentially is that most organisms have one given base pair at a given position, right? Say we have an A base pair, okay? Uh, so they will, the way this notation works is you don't write the A, you just, you just leave it blank. And then if somebody has something else, so say has a C at that position, right? then you don't write the C, you'll just put a cross saying it's a mutation, which means that person has somebody else. Which really means is that everybody has an A and this one has a C. Okay? So it just, and then the A will be called the dominant one and this will be the mutant. Okay? And then, what then, um, so there'll be a dominant allele, say the A, base pair and then the C will be the mutant. Now, because historically, now we know that these are base pairs and mutations actually are changes in base pairs, but when people first started thinking about it, they didn't know about DNA, they didn't know about, uh, about base pairs, they didn't know about any of this, right? There was Mendel crossing his plant, right? You've all heard about that, right? The Czech monk. Uh, and so he just said, there's two types. 
you can have the dominant type, which will be a capital A, which is not the same thing as this A, right? This is just, it just so happens it's the same letter. And there'll be a, the mutant type, which is a little a, okay? And that's, it's really genome, just means it's something genetic, but you can really think of it as a type. Okay, and in a way this reduces the problem to a binary problem because you have the main one and then you have the other one which is less frequent and at least in principle, okay? And then you define the frequencies. You say this one has frequency N1 and this one has frequency A, A2. And so it, the idea is that at least at the beginning this one will be the more common one, and the question is, can this one take over and become the more common one, right? Just, just to, now, just for notation, and we'll get back to it, the way people traditionally called the frequencies, they gave the frequencies names P and Q. So sometimes in literature, you'll just see a P and a Q, and sometimes they won't even bother to explain to you that it's a frequency, because if you're a geneticist, P and Q automatically means frequency to you, okay? Just a sort of notation aside. Uh, okay, uh, of course, it can happen that somebody else here will have not a C, but a T or something else, uh, but in, in the, large majority of cases, you'll have really the dominant one and then the a mutant that appears and at any given time, there'll be a small number of mutants. Well, at least that's the approximation we're gonna work in today. So we only need to worry about the other one. So the problem is really uh, binary. Okay, uh, and then we'll, we'll get there in a second, but of course, this is just at one position, but you have many positions, so then you can imagine somebody has an AA, which doesn't mean that they have the same base pair next to it, it just means at the second position, they're also the dominant, they have the dominant one. And somebody will have an AA, and somebody will have an AA, and, and so on, okay? So it's just reduced notation. Uh, and, and so on, you can, write it up, but we'll, and then you can define frequencies of all these things. But we'll get there in a second. So let's first think about just one, and okay, and this genotype is also called an allele. I'll write it down. And it's just a genetic word, again, meaning type, for at least the purposes of as physicists. Um, okay, so we are not going to worry about the fact that we have two chromosomes. We as humans have two chromosomes. Uh, haploids have one chromosome. Uh, we have haploids in our body. All our gametes are haploids, right? Gametes are the, the reproductive cells, so sperms and oocytes, but there's also many organisms that have more than two chromosomes, okay? So just like, like we have two, for example, goldfish have, I don't know, four or six or something, okay? They have more. Uh, and then, uh, if this has to go here and this has to, sorry, I'm, uh, see whether this works now. Okay, so, so j just as a sort of funny aside, but let, let's get to working out these frequencies. So we have some population that has the large A and there's N1 of them, and we have some population, N2 of them, that has the little A. I just write the big A, little A. And they can mutate into each other. So if the, if the large A has a mutation, it becomes little a, and the little a, if it's an organism of little a, if it has a mutation, it becomes big A. And this happens with rates mu1 and mu2, and other than that, they reproduce, because that's what organisms do. And they reproduce with rates gamma. So gamma i 
is the growth rate. And it's an effective growth rate, so it actually includes both birth and death. We're not going to worry about it. It's just how fast this population grows on average. Okay, and this is, this is mutation. Okay, so then we can write down simple deterministic equations for how these frequencies change. So how does N1 change? Well, what can happen, right, if you're in, in a large allele? Well, you can mutate and become N2, or you can mutate out of N2, sorry, other way around. Uh, you can mutate, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, 2, 2, right? You can mutate out of 2 to become N1, or you can mutate out of 1 to become N2, and you will grow. Same thing for N2. You mutate from 1 to become N2, you mutate from 2 to become N1, and you grow with your rate. And we're going to make an assumption, which is very often made in population genetics, that the population size is constant. So that N, which is N1 plus N2, is constant. So this is called constant population size. Okay? Now we can discuss whether this is reasonable for what kind of population, but for example in the experiments that I'll tell you about, it is roughly true because that, you know, you can keep it fixed in an experiment and then you have to, each individual has to uh, fall into one of these uh, groups. But now what we're going to do is we're going to actually enforce this on these equations. And we're going to enforce this by the form of this rate. So we're going to assume a form that each of these rates has a part that really comes from linear growth and a part that whose only purpose is to keep the constant population size. Okay, so this is linear growth. And this is chosen to keep n constant. Okay, so let's figure out what it has to be for n to be constant. So n constant means that dn dt doesn't change in time, right? The sum of n1 and 2. So we have to calculate what that is, and to do that we have to sum these two equations. And you may have noticed that these two equations, these two terms cancel out, so we're just left with gamma 1 plus gamma 2. Okay. Which we've defined as r1 n1 plus r2 n2 uh, and minus these two terms, again, I have n1 plus n2 over n, so n over n, so I'm just left with df. Okay, and that uh, gives me an expression directly for f1, fn2, which has to be r1 uh, plus r1, n1 plus r2, n2. Okay, so now I can plug this in, uh, but I'm going to plug it in, uh, well, okay, also because of this constant population size, we also realize that we don't actually need n1 and n2, we only need one of these variables, right, because the other one is set constant, so I can define x as n1 over n, and I'm going to write, rewrite the equations for x. Here. 
Okay. Okay, so I have mu2 uh, one over n, and then I have n2, which I'm gonna rewrite this n minus n1 minus one over n, uh, well, n1 over n mu1 plus gamma, which I'm going to write out explicitly, so R1, N1 over N, uh, plus R2, plus R2, N minus N1 over N. I think that's everything. Uh, no, because I, I lost one, yeah, plus, uh, oh, okay, I, I, I know what I screwed up, so let's do it again. So, plus, it's R1, N1 over N, so that was correct, and then I have minus N1, over n, R1, N1 over n, plus R2, n minus N1 over n. Okay, so that's correct. Okay, so we'll rewrite it in terms of Q's. So from here I have mu2 minus x, mu1 plus mu2. So that takes care of all the mu terms. And then I have R1x minus R1x squared minus R2x plus R2x squared. Yeah. Okay, so let me just collect terms here. I have x R1 minus R2 minus x squared R1 minus R2. And collect terms further, x r1 minus r2, 1 minus x. Okay. Um, so what this is, is a different of, difference of growth rates, right? So what the difference of growth rate is, is selection. How much better some one individual grows than the other is the selective advantage it has because that means it'll spread faster, it'll grow faster, right? And so there'll be more of them. So this we'll call the selection coefficient. Or the selection strength, if you prefer. Same thing. And then we have our equation, which is very now, which is simple. Um, it's mu2 minus mu1 plus mu2x plus sx1 minus. Okay. So this is the basic deterministic equation for mutation and selection. And the important term here is really, is this term, which has a very characteristic form. It has this x1 minus x nonlinearity, which comes essentially from the constant population size and from the fact that if the n1 allele increases, right, if x goes up, then the other one has to go down. So that introduces competition. And this term will come up over and over again wherever you go in population genetics, okay? And uh, it's good, it's, this is a sort of simple derivation to help you understand uh, where it comes from. But yeah, it essentially reflects the fact that allele frequencies have to replace each other. 
Okay, so we can analyze this equation. First, we can say what happens if there's no selection. So that's easy. Well, all of this is easy, but okay. So if there's no selection, we get rid of this term. And if we, if we look at steady state, so we have dx dt equals to zero, mu two minus mu one plus mu two x equals zero. And we just get a steady state solution given by the relative frequencies. Okay, so you just get a balance of mutation rates that you have this A and you have the A and you have the mu rates between here and you find an equilibrium for, for X between these. So you get the balance. Mutation. Then we have no mutation. So then we have dx dt equals s x1 minus x. And we know, so x1 minus x looks like this. Well, it's, okay, it's symmetric, but I can't draw. Um, let me try and draw it symmetrically. Okay. This is what it looks like. So you have two steady states one which is zero and one uh, which is one. So the zero one, this means extinction. And the one is called fixation. Okay, right? If you die, you die and you can't, in this framework that, you know, you can't come back. Uh, and it's the same thing, if the fixation is also, uh, absorbing boundary, right? Because once you take over the population, then you can't, there's no other one. Uh, and of course, so it depends. So dx t, if it's larger than, is larger than zero, if s is larger than zero, and then you have certain fixation. So that means that n1 dominates, and conversely, and two dominates. Okay, and then you have the case where you have both. So both mutation and selection are different from zero. Then you have essentially a quadratic equation to solve in steady state, which you can solve. It has a solution. It's not, it's not incredibly insightful. can just something like that. Uh, but in the limit of mu1 equals mu2 and everything else being equal, this roughly goes as 1 minus 2 mu over s. And so that there's a fixed point like that, and this is called this solution is called mutation selection balance. And that's what you have in a lot of cases. Okay. So just a simple analysis of these equations. Um, and now we're going to do something quite Uh, sort of algebraic, but the result of that is useful. It's useful to know what it is, so we're going to do it. It's not, 
uh, you know, it's a sort of incredibly simple calculation, but it explains sort of the basis of the rest of what uh, we'll be doing. Um, so can I, yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, so I, I said mu1 equal to mu2. Just to give you an idea of, you know, what's the scale. So the reason it's called mutation selection balance is because it gives you a mutation over selection coefficient. And, you know, obviously this thing is, is between zero and one, which is, you know, the only maybe interesting thing about it, right? Okay. Now, what happens if we have diploids? So diploids are organisms that have two chromosomes, uh, like ourselves. So then we can imagine... two possibilities, right? That you get, you have two parents and you get one of each of these from each of your parents so you can have any three of these combinations. And there's frequencies for all of them. And does this actually matter what these are? Maybe not. Okay. So uh, we're going to now and try and calculate what is the frequency in the next generation if uh, these individuals mate. So we're going to assume random mating discrete generations and infinite population size, which allows us to be in this deterministic regime. And we're going to define two frequencies, P, which will be the overall frequency of the dominant allele, so of capital A, and Q, which is uh, one of one minus p, and then we're going to actually mate these things. Yeah, make babies. Okay, make allele babies. Uh, so we're going to write out the the mating table. Why don't I do it here? Uh, actually, why don't I do it here so we can... Right? So, these are the assumptions of our, of our mating game, which are, again, completely unrealistic, probably even if you're, a, you know, a yeast in a test tube. Uh, but, okay, I sorry, I misspelled mating, which probably won't help. There's no... Uh, it's the frequency of the offspring and then the progeny. Progeny means kids. Okay, so if A and A meet, then they're going to, the only possible outcome is AA, right? So, and the frequency, the probability of these two meeting is AA squared. Everybody agrees? Good. Okay, now we need big AA means uh, AA. So this is called a homozygote and this is called a heterozygote because they're hetero because they're different and homo because they're the same, right? So, okay, so if these two meet, then they can now produce, the, then things can get more interesting, right? 
Like if these two have blue eyes, this one's going to have blue eyes. But if these two meet and one of them doesn't have blue eyes, then life becomes more interesting. Okay, so you can have, you can still get an AA because this can go with that. And you can get an A and an A, but all of both of them you get with probability one half, right? <clears throat> but now the probability of something like this happening is FAA times FAA times two, because either one of the parents can be, th this, this can be one par parent one, this can be parent two, or this can be parent one and this can be parent two. So there's two ways of getting this combination. Okay. So same thing here. So now two homozygous meet, but the two different homozygous. So the outcome is, there's only one possibility, but since they're different, there's still two ways of this happening. Uh, okay, I'm going to fill in the table. You get the idea. It's not the most... Right here we have all possible outcomes, but since they're the same, it's squared, A, A, A. As I said, this is a sort of, this is, you know, a silly calculation. It's not very profound, uh, but the result actually is interesting. Okay, so this is our mating table. Okay. This is one half. Oh, I have a, I should, yeah, you're right. Okay, good. So you're, so you know, you, you know how the game works. Okay. Uh, okay, so now we want to find the probability, the frequency of this one in the next generation. So I can call it, it you know, T plus one. Okay, so we just have to sum up every time we had an A, A appear. So we have the square. Uh, then why do we have another A, A? We have the one half F, A, F, A because we have an AA here. I can use my chalk now. We have this, we have that, and we have this, and that's it, right? So the last one is one fourth uh, FA squared. And this is, yeah. I mean, you compare a, the first A with the first A, and the second A with the second A. So uh, what is the probability of having both uh, capital A and small? Well, because you can get it this way and this way. Uh, they are not uh, ordered. No, 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 no. So that, that's the, that will give us, okay. So, um, No, there is no two. So if I do this, I can write this as, okay? And from the definition of P, this is P squared. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually confused about that myself right now. Because I think it should be, but then it doesn't work, does it? Unless we screwed up the... It works with the two? Okay. If, if you say so, I really can't see it from here, <laughs> but I'll trust you. It sh I mean, it makes sense for it to be there. One half, yeah, no, it does, okay, because it's two, okay, good. Uh, so then we can, do, we can do the second one. Okay, I mean, yeah, let, let's do the second one and let's not do the third one because then, then you, you, you get the idea. So now we're looking at, uh, at the probabilities of little a. So yeah, so that's two times a a plus two f a f a plus one half uh, f a squared plus one half times two f a f a okay and if you bring this together And this is 2p1 minus p. And then if you do the third one the same way, which we won't do, but you, so this is t plus 1, t plus 1, uh, you can, you know, you, you get, not surprisingly, 1 minus p squared. So what, now, why is this interesting? So here we got p squared, here we got 2p1 minus p, and here we get 1 minus p squared. So all the frequencies in the next generation are described by one parameter. Okay, so the pr frequency of no matter what in t plus 1 is some, well, I'll just write it out, function of p, which is the frequency uh, of the a allele in, uh, well, P or Q doesn't matter since it's symmetric, of the A allele in the previous generation, right? So in order, although there's diploids and although there's mating and all this, of course this is only because there's random mating, but you, all you need to know is how many big A's are there in this generation to know how many big A's will, or how many big A's or how many of these heterozygous will there be in the next generation. So to predict the frequency of any individual in the next, any type of genotype in the next generation, all you need to know is the frequency of, that, of the allele in the next generation. So this is a result which is called, which has an extremely fancy name, as you can see for what it is. It's called, um, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and it's just called HW equilibrium. And the reason it's important is because we can forget about all this mating and all this, these complications, at least in models like that, and all we need to do is we just need to look at the frequency of this allele. And that's why from now on, that's all we're gonna do, okay? And essentially for the last nearly now a hundred years, that's all population genetics has been doing, okay? And of course, there's more complicated things that can happen. Nobody may, you know, even yeast don't made randomly and so on. Uh, but for many explanations of what goes on, this is a good model and that's why we're sticking to it. And that's why we went to the, through the pain of going through this, as I said, essentially boring calculation because it's an important result that motivates uh, what will 
come later. Okay, so uh, okay, so there's another. So r from now on, we go. Now we're going to move to a. Uh, well, soon we're going to move to a stochastic description of all of this. That now that we've done the basics, and um, maybe just before we do that, before the break, I'll show you some some results. So there's another important thing is that, as we've sort of shown with the previous calculation, a very likely outcome of uh, any allele is that it'll die. In fact, once, once you, you'll see that when we uh, take into account stochasticity, that is essentially the fate of every mutant in time, right? A mutation appears, it grows, well, unless it fixes, it will most probably die after some, some time. So the fate of each mutation is definitely not in steady state. But we can still look at steady state distributions of mutant frequencies. We can look at the population level, at the distribution, and we'll see that there are things that are on average that are uh, in steady state. And just to sort of show you some of the things that actually can happen, uh, so, this is the, the first one up there is what's called the simple selective sweep. And that's what we described with our deterministic model when things either got, went extinct or would uh, fixate. So, there's the A, A allele, and then suddenly an S mutant comes about. And the S mutant is good, and it starts to spread. So up there you see a picture of it actually spreading and below you actually see the frequency of that mutant. And then you see that it fixes and that means that the A1 has to go extinct. Okay? These are cartoons based, uh, drawn on based on yeast experiments um, that we'll talk about in a second. But then another thing can happen, this is called clonal interference and we'll also talk about this tomorrow in more detail, is that the same thing happens, S appears, and then before S manages to, uh, to overtake the whole population and fix, another mutant appears, C, and C is way better than S, and then it really, it outcompetes S. So it's called interference because there's two clones now, C and S, and they're directly competing. And then you can have more complex dynamics because you can have uh, another mutant appear on the background of C or on the background of S. And, you know, you would, if you look at the frequency of traces, you would start seeing funky things like that. And then there's something called frequency-dependent selection that, in fact, the two mutants, C and S, can coexist, that they're comparably good, well one is slightly better than the other, but not good enough to overtake the whole population, and you will see this steady uh, equilibrium. So all of these things happen in, uh, at least in the lab, and we'll talk a bit about differences between the lab and the not lab. But one important a parameter to sort of motivate what's going to come happen now is population size. So if the population size is is relatively small, then so the the, popu the size the population size here is sort of depicted by the width uh, of that uh, of of the of the lines. You see the number of individuals. Then it's quite easy to sweep. If you're good, you're going to take over. But if uh, the population size is, is, is larger, then other things can happen before you manage to sweep and you get this clonal interference type uh, dynamics, which happens in the other uh, three panels. Okay, so time-wise, I guess it's break time, right? Uh, so we take 10 minutes and we come back. Yeah. Uh, with uh, Q, we have noted 
So before, before we go back to calculations, one last thing about an experiment. So you can ask, and people did ask in the past, uh, how do we know that, um, you know, how, how do we know that there's this picture of mutations happening and then selection act, acting on these mutations? How do we know that it's not uh, different? Uh, how do we know specifically that it's not that there's some selection pressure and then mute that induces mutations? And so in the 40s, a physicist called uh, Delbruck and a biologist called Luria did an experiment to show this. Because in the 30s, people basically, they had no problems with this being true for... Uh, for higher organisms, for like us or giraffes, right? Which is what Lamarck was considering, that the giraffe's neck grows because the giraffe wants to eat. So they're like, okay, we know it doesn't happen for that, but for bacteria and viruses, maybe it actually does happen that, that way, that when there's a selective pressure, then the bacteria react. So they did this experiment, which is known as the Luria Delbruck experiment in the 40s. And it's really one of the most classic experiments. And it's a beautiful also example of how probabilistic thinking or physics can be used to uh, understand the real life phenomenon. So they said there's two possibilities. One's are induced mutations and the other ones are spontaneous mutations. So what spontaneous mutations means is that mutations happen all the time at any given time. So in this population, they can happen here. In this population, they can happen earlier, right? These are dividing bacteria. Here, nothing happens. Here, they happen here. And then uh, what they do at the end of the experiment is that they put some selective pressure and then depending on when the population had its mutation, the number of mu individuals that actually have the mutation will survive, right? So here, nobody will survive. Here, this one will survive. But here, the mutation happened early on, so many individuals will survive because all the offspring of that individual have that mutation, right? And then in the induced mutation scenario, they say, well, nothing happens until, unless there's actually stress. And then at the end, the stress, and when the stress comes, so the antibiotic in this case, then the bacteria will uh, start to pr find the, produce the mutation, and they'll produce this mutation, and this will, what, will happen. So intuitively, the difference between these two scenarios is if you look at here at how many bacteria survive, it depends that there's a, there's a striking difference between these two scenarios because in the induced mutation, you don't have a lot of time to produce the mutations. So in every colony, on every one of your experimental plates, you'll have roughly similar numbers of mutations. Uh, and in fact, they'll be Poisson distributed, right? Because it's just random appearances. But if you look here, then if you look at the different colonies, then you'll have very different numbers of mutations because it depends on the history of when this mutation happened. Um, so yeah, so this is what this shows, that in the uh, induced mutation or acquired mutation uh, hypothesis, you'll have a low variance before, between plates, and in the natural mutation hypothesis, you'll have a high variance, okay? basic idea. And you can quantify that specifically, you can do a calculation, which you can do for fun if you're interested, that, uh, okay, so in the adaptive mutation scenario is basically at every time at when the antibiotic is put there, the cell has to divide, will decide will I have a mutation or will I not have a mutation, and every cell does this independently. So if you ask every cell independently, do you have a mutation or do you not have a mutation? What distribution is that? A cell is like a coin being flipped. Okay. <laughs> so you have some instinct in you. <laughs> right. So, right. And what's the limit uh, uh, of, uh, well, okay, I'll tell you that in, in, in the limit of 
you know, a, a binomial distribution and a limit is a Poisson distribution, right? So if you look at the distribution in this case, you'll see a Poisson distribution of uh, bacteria that had a mutation. Now in this case, which is the case where, you know, mutations appear randomly through time. So mutations are still Poisson distributed, right? because it's, it's the limit of the binomial, it's still every cell at some point in time it asks itself a question, at every point in time it asks itself the question, will I mutate, will I not mutate? Some of them mutate, right? So at every point in time there's a Poisson distribution of mutations, but you're not asking the cells at every point in time, you're asking at some later time. So like we saw in the diagram, the one that had a mutation before, now all of it, of now all of its offspring will have a mutation. So you need to propagate this Poisson distribution in time. Okay, and at the end of the day, when you ask the cells with the antibiotic, they'll have a different distribution than a Poisson distribution. And this, uh, this distribution is called the Luria-Delbruck distribution. Uh, and it's not uh, because it, this was the first time it was um, derived. It's, it, it's a long-tailed distribution, okay? So we're not going to derive it because it takes quite a bit of time to do it, and it's actually very tricky. Uh, but the basic idea is that this is Poisson and this is long-tailed with large variants. With, okay, so if now I do the simplest thing possible, I look at the variance to the mean, here I should get one, and here, I should get something larger than one. And if you actually do it on, this, on the example of this diagram, you can calculate the variance to the mean here and here. And here you'll get, well, you get, you'll get one, and here you won't get, you'll get something larger than one. You won't get the complete right answer for the Luria-Delbruck distribution because it's just two generations. Uh, but it, it, it works out. So this, this is what the plates look like. Uh, with the, 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 this is a paper picture from the 1943 paper where they you know, took real life photographs of the plates. Uh, the first thing they did is they tested for plating bias so that when they actually take the bacteria and put the antibiotic whether they don't uh, whether they don't have any sampling bias. So again, sampling should, if everything is done right, should be Poissonian. So they should have a mean to the variance of roughly one. And they do, again, within experimental error. I mean, you see that the middle one isn't perfect. But the other ones are actually pretty amazing, given these are live experiments. So then they actually did the experiment and they looked at the average per sample uh, and the variance um, corrected for sampling. And so if you now look at the mean to the variance in these experiments, you see that these are way off, uh, the, 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 they are much different than one, right? The variance is really much larger than one. So, so you see it. Uh, then, uh, and this is actually the distribution that they, they measured compared to the theoretical distribution uh, in, um, in white. So then they, they did something else based on this experiment. They actually wanted to calculate the mutation rate of bacteria. And they did it in two ways. One way uh, was from... Uh, from the distribution they derived, so we won't go into that. But the other way was uh, pretty nice and extremely simple, so I'll show you how to do it. So as we said that mutations when they appear are Poisson distributed. So when they appear, the probability of having a mutation is the mutation rate times the number of mutations. Okay? Uh, so the probability of seeing a plate with zero mutations, well, is just the zeroth term of this. So it's just e to the minus mutation rate. 
So that means from this, I have an explicit expression for the mutation rate. Okay? So A is the mutation rate. And P0 is just the number of zero colony plates. So they repeat this on many plates to the total number of plates. So they can't use any of the, any information from the plates that had one mutation, is, from the plates that had a colony with one mutation, two mutations, or, or so on, because those have already grown in time. So they don't know when they appeared, and those are not from a Poisson distribution. To do that, they have to, they do what's called method two, uh, is that they actually take the full distribution they derived. But without even doing that, they know that if there's zero mutations, then uh, they know the, what's the probability, what they should expect, given a given mutation rate, what's the probability of seeing a plate that has zero mutations? Yeah? Sorry, it's speak up. Very large of plates, yeah, they had they, exactly. So they need a huge number of plates. So uh, th this is this is this is a less accurate. Um, so from that, uh, they. So I don't actually remember which is. This is method one. So this is the. Yeah, yeah, no, they, 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 it's a, this is a less, I'm not going to argue this is the best, okay, this is a good, an easy or good way of doing it, right? The problem is you need uh, a lot of zero colony uh, plates to get good statistics, and uh, it's very hard to do it. So, in fact, this is, so, this is something that's so easy that you could do this, like, if we had a lab, or if you go on your day trip to CISA, you can do this. Okay, if somebody, you can convince somebody here to do this. And I guarantee you, you won't get the, the, the number you'll get from doing it this way, and the number you'll get from actually doing it from the Luria-Delbrook distribution will be quite different. Okay, but in principle, it's a neat idea because you really, okay, the, the Luria-Delbrook distribution, the reason it's hard to, uh, derive is that you actually have to figure out what's the probability distribution of times when the mutations happened. And there's always some unknown about that. You know, you can, you can have a model, but you put in assumptions, and you put assumptions about how it grows. You assume that it grows, the colony grows exponentially. It doesn't always have to grow exponentially. So, you know, the, it, it's just to say, in if you had a huge amount of plates, this is a very clean and simple way. But you're completely right that that is the main problem with doing it this way. Okay. Uh, so another experiment. So this is, okay, fast forward to the 1980s. And this is a guy called Rich Lensky who, uh, you know, people, people have been saying things for a while, for a long time, like, oh, if we could replay the tape of life, okay? This is, this is a big thing, that we're here, we've evolved, but if we could replay the tape of life and start evolution from the beginning, would we look the same, right? And so Rich Lensky said, oh, shut up and stop asking, let's just do it. And so, of course, he's not going to evolve us, or dinosaurs, or anything like that, but he can do it with bacteria. So he took E. coli, K12, the world famous K12, which I, I can tell you more about in a second. Uh, and it's a strain of E. coli, and he said, I'm going to evolve them in my lab. And he started in the 80s, and he's still going, so now I think we're at 60,000 or so Lensky generations. What he does is he lets them grow, then he samples them, freezes the, the sample, uh, you know, to basically takes the one samples from the top, so the ones that grew the best, 
puts them in a new flask, lets them grow, puts them in a new flask, puts them in. Of course, he does not do this himself. So if you're considering, a, you know, doing your graduate work or a postdoc in the Lensky lab, you should know that you will live on the bacteria's schedule. Uh, and um, so, you know, so he, you know, there's, there's these huge fridges, you can Google this, and, you know, he freezes them. So now if you go and say, hey, Rich, I want a sample from you from 1993, which you're not going to say like that, but I want one of your, you know, one of your 2000 generation lines, he puts it in a FedEx envelope and mails it to you. Okay, and then you can start your experiment. So uh, we, we will maybe discuss, yes, yeah, so now we're over 60,000 generations. The amazing thing about 60,000 generations is that for humans, that's uh, 1.5 million years. So that predates the emergence of Homo sapiens on Earth. Okay, so he, his bacteria have had a lot of time to do funky stuff. Uh, so the other thing, he, so this is called, well, by everybody, it's called the Lensky experiment. By Lensky himself, it's called the long-term evolution experiment. Uh, and the other thing he does is he then competes his strains. So he takes the ancestral strain and he takes some evolved strain from whatever generation and he puts them in one flask and he comes back after some time and he plates them. So he, he puts them on a plate and then he sees which one grows better. Okay, so from that he can actually measure fitness. Fitness is a word for growth rate in this field. Basically how fast they grow. So he can measure fitness as a function of time. That's what these lines show for two strains. And the idea, so you know, his initial idea was also this will allow me to measure mutation rates, selection coefficients, understand what's going on in evolution. What I think he's understood and the community has understood is that it's way more complicated than anybody imagined in the 1980s. Uh, here are some really simple examples of probably what they did imagine. So there's an idea of fitness landscape. Okay, so there's a landscape. You can think it's, it's like an, essentially an energy function and if you're higher on this landscape then you're fitter you'll outgrow it but of course you can imagine having a rugged landscape having different peaks that there's no one global optimum and so this is what goes on here that you know that the red one and the green one have found different solutions the red one is still a bit better then there's the concept of generalists and specialists. So a generalist is somebody who's very good in one environment. So the blue one here, the A one, is a, is a generalist in environment A, and the orange one is a, sorry, it's a specialist. A specialist is somebody who's good in one environment. The generalist is somebody who's good in many environments. So A is a specialist of environment A, and B is a specialist of environment B, the orange one. But A is bad in B and B is bad in A. But then there's the third one, C, the green one, who's not the best possible one in both, in either of these environments, but is pretty good in both. Okay, and so he's seeing the evolution of both specialists and generalists uh, in his data. So this is essentially uh, this is the adaptive evolution experiment, another picture of this, the, 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 the long-term evolution experiment, this is what I've been talking to you about, is that you start off and you basically explore this landscape and they're trying, at least in a constant environment, they're trying to find the best possible solution. The idea of all of this is that the Lensky lab is like bacteria heaven, right? It's, it's at least, it's a place where uh, it's a constant environment. It's not like anything has changed since 1986, okay? Uh, I, I'll tell you tomorrow about one of the really funky things that they uh, have evolved. Uh, and, but they, you know, the idea is that generally the phenotype changes and the fitness increases with generations and we do see the increase of fitness. We also do see a slowing down of the increase of fitness. Uh, and now people are sort of trying to understand where does that come from exactly. 
Uh, and then you have the mutation accumulation experiments, which is something slightly different, which is where you say, I don't want to select for something. I don't want to select for the best thing, but I want to accumulate as many mutations as possible. And to do that, people try to eliminate selection and uh, impose randomness. So they're gonna, we're going to go to a limit that we're going to talk about right now uh, to uh, basically the, the most random part possible. And so randomness in all of this comes from, again, small numbers, small population sizes, okay? And so what they do is they let the bacteria grow, but not to get to high population sizes. They stop at still relatively small population sizes, and then they take one bacteria out, or a few, but a very small number, and put it in a different plate and let that start up the colony. And before it manages to take over, uh, any mutation actually manages to spread, they do the same thing. So they really try to randomize by very taking it very quickly and taking just one, so having a very sorry, large bottleneck, it should say, uh, basically, well, it depends how you define bottleneck, but you want to take as little as possible. And then at the end of the day, you end up with a population that has sampled many different mutations because you've eliminated selection and enhanced randomness. So then if you look at the distribution of mutations, you have a distribution in that. So, okay. So why don't we now... Uh, talk a bit about drift. So how much time do I have? What's the official? Uh, until one, okay. Okay, so what we're going to talk about now is called genetic drift. which is the world's worst name, okay? Because genetic drift is actually diffusion. Okay, just, you'll, you'll see. It's the random term, but because the term comes from population genetics, which is more a field of math than of physics, uh, it's been called that, and, but you'll see it's essentially a diffusion term, okay. So, as w before that, we, when in, in the previous hour, we talked about large population sizes, but populations, of course, are not infinite. And, in fact, the most important thing, even more so than populations are not infinite or very large, is that each allele has to start with a, at a small frequency. Because when a mutation happens, it has to start with one mutant, right? There's no other way. So... Somewhere in the evolutionary process, we always have the number one. And the number one is always much smaller than the number of the, popu than the population size. There's no way around it, okay? So that's why evolution is inherently a random process. Um, so, okay. So we're going to go back. We're, we're going to get away from our A's and A's, but just to... Uh, to do that, so we had n, A was N over N, and this was 1 N over N in frequency, okay? Our popular, we're going to still keep a constant population size, which is going to be N. And so we're going to look at discrete time. Well, uh, maybe not so important. We're going to look at... Uh, Okay, me, I don't have to. We're going to uh, have overlapping generations, and we're going to choose one individual to die in each generation and one individual to reproduce. So let's imagine we start, so we start off with n plus 1 uh, individuals, and we want to get to n individuals. So the way we can do it is, well, we pick one of these n plus 1 individuals to die, and we have to make sure that nobody else gets born in this time. So this is death and this is not birth, which is equally important because if in this 
period of time that we're looking at somebody else dies, then we're back to having n, okay? If we start off with n minus 1, same thing. Uh, we have to, we ha somebody has to be born, so we have to pick that somebody, and then we have to have this person not die. Or nobody else can die. And that'll give us n. And then we can also have the situation where somebody, uh, that the same individual, whoops, is born, well, that somebody is born and dies so that the same thing uh, happens. And so it's either one of the alleles, either the big one or the small one can be, somebody from that fraction can die and, and be born. Okay. So then we can calculate, based on this graph, the probability of the A allele having frequency n at time t. So that's what this is. And so given that they had 1 plus t, then we have this scenario, n plus 1, 1 minus n plus 1 over n. Uh, Given that it was n minus 1, then we have, sorry, this is t minus 1. Yeah, this is, this is this, this is this, and then this is the middle line when essentially nothing happens, but nothing can happen by both birth and death. Okay, so as you can suspect, we're gonna write, rewrite this in terms of frequencies now. And uh, we're also going to do something else. We're gonna measure time in the number of generations. So that means that P, well, Pn of t is just going to go to Px of t. That's a simple. But Pn plus 1 or minus 1 of t will go to Px plus 1 minus 1 of t. Or of you know, minus 1, essentially, in the equations that have. So what that means is that now 1, uh, well, okay, we're not yet... No, the, the, this, this is just the colorary of that. But we're going to uh, deal with this in a second. So we have, sorry, Px of t. And so I'm just going to rewrite everything. Uh, okay. I'm going to try and not screw this up. Okay, and then the last term, which is easy, x of t, x squared, 1 minus x squared. And this we can rewrite. I write it here so that you see more easily. 1 minus 2x, 1 minus x, just algebra. 
Okay. So now we're going to do the same thing we were doing yesterday. We're going to Taylor expand. So I'm going to define a function, which is plus minus 1 of n, which is p of x uh, plus minus 1 of n t minus 1. Okay, and I'm going to expand it. I'm going to tailor expand around 1 over n equals 0. Um, will it bother you tremendously if I, uh, if I put this X in a parenthesis now instead of as a subscript? No? So it's just a change of notation, but it'll be easier. I'm just going to do this. It's the same thing. Nothing changed, okay? I'll write it out. Notation change for laziness. Okay, so I'm expanding what I have here. I have first the plus one. Then the minus one. And then I have whatever's left over from here. So I have P of XT uh, minus 2. And actually, I have X1 minus X, which is the same thing I have here. So this is 2 F of X. OK, so now I am going to proceed to cancel things. So the Fs cancel. And the first terms cancel. And um, and this is t minus one. Um, and I have p of x t minus p of x t minus one. Uh, equals one over n squared because these add two f x squared. And so now I'm going to divide this by 1 over n, which is the same thing as multiplying here by n. And 1 over n is the generation time. Okay, it's the time of one generation, right? I pick an individual, I pick a generation, I, I pick... Um, so it's basically the characteristic time scale of the problem. Uh, I pick an individual. I have n individuals. I pick one from these n individuals. So that gives me a time scale of 1 over n. And I'm taking 1 over n to 0. So that means I take n to infinity. And since this 1 is a generation, this is essentially 1 over n2. So then this limit just becomes 
the dp of x of t and the uh, square goes away because of that. Okay, and I can write out the f precisely, so let me do that. Um, So this is what we call genetic drift. And so what genetic drift is, is the randomness coming from small, uh, from the fact that the, the, well, from small numbers in evolution and population genetics, from the fact that basically you always start with uh, one individual and even if nothing interesting really happens that they just you know, we don't have any mutations here, we don't have any selection yet. We just have them reproducing. And so just from the small numbers, you get a, a stochastic term. And this stochastic term is a diffusion term. That's why I said initially that it's like diffusion. And now we can add to this um, Let me rewrite the full equation. We can add the terms we derived before, and you can derive them in a stochastic way by adding them to the diagram we just wrote down and the redoing the calculation if you want. Uh, but what you will get is if you actually add them, uh, and you can see them because they're there in the stochastic version, well, you get selection, you get mutation, so do you get the real, the, the physics drift. And then you have, okay, the other thing to notice is that our reappearance of our favorite term, x1 minus x, of course, because again, somebody but this, the population size is constant, so somebody dies, somebody has to be born. Um, and so this is the full this is the full equation with mutation, selection, and drift. And so you can solve this in steady state. You can actually solve it even out of steady state. Okay, out of steady state, this is given by, uh, sorry, not what I mean, what do I mean by out of, you can solve the full, uh, full equation, you can f solve for the dynamics of this, but in st the, 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 there's a Gegenbau, there's a special function solution, but, okay, but in steady state, there's a, uh, there's a simple solution, let me set mu1 equal to mu2 to mu just for simplicity, um, well, okay, let me first write out the thing, then you can, just so you see it. So then P of X is C X and you want to... And if we set mu1 equal to mu2 equal to mu, then we get... So let's plot this. Um, so if we take the limit of small mutation rate, Then this is, you know, similarly to what we had before. Uh, the x1 minus x terms will dominate. This is new mu1 much less than 1. And we have 0 and 1. 
we have a distribution P of X that looks like this. So most of the population is either extinct or fixed. Uh, and then you have ex occasional excursions uh, between the two. And then the other one can fix. The opposite limit, when the mutation rate is large, get a distribution like this. If S is smaller than the mutation rate, remember deterministically we got mu plus mu, so we would get about a half. Here we get a half plus s over 8 mu as the mean of this distribution. But this is essentially near, this is called near neutrality. Because selection doesn't matter because of this limit. Uh, yeah, this is the extinction fixation scenario. And then we have also n mu larger than 1. But selection is now strong, and this reproduce gives us back the mutation selection balance. Again, with the these are all p of x's. Okay, and so this is what we're going to talk about next week. This is a limit where you now have a lot of mutations and they're all being selected upon and you essentially end up with many lineages at the same time, many mutants coming up uh, and fixing. So I can just, I mean, for those of you that mentioned it, this is just a slide that shows that uh, this is a, a simulation that's showing that the effects of the demography uh, and selection, so demography meaning a bottleneck and selection are very hard to distinguish. And if you look at the, uh, this is a distribution of the, how many times you see a derived allele, so the little a. Uh, in neutrality, it sort of goes on, so you see the neutral prediction that it's sort of a, it decays uh, and flattens out. Uh, if you have selection or a bottleneck, it will go up uh, like that. So uh, you get this characteristic U-shapes, and these characteristic U-shapes is what you actually see in data. But there is a huge question of where they come from and what's their origin. And since many factors give you the same thing, that it's very hard to distinguish. Okay, so maybe one last thing. So we won't talk about this much, but as uh, I sort of maybe mention it in some experiments tomorrow. Uh, another big thing is, of course, recombination. So mixing of, uh, of chromosomes. So I just want to put that out there. Uh, so that, you know, you are aware this is a major force of evolution that is present in every organism, including bacteria. Bacteria do share DNA and recombine the DNA. It's called horizontal gene transfer. Okay, so we'll end here for today. And tomorrow we'll continue with adaptation. I'm a little obsessed with the end to infinity limit here.